University of Delaware. We have a nice group of people here in Pearson Hall, but we also have people on Zoom. Thank you for joining us here today. So a few things before we uh, introduce our speaker. Um, we will have a talk about 30 to 35 minutes. Then we will have the Q&A session. Please feel free to unmute yourself to folks who are on Zoom um, or type it out. I'll be here moderating the Q&A session. And then after 15 minutes, uh, the faculty will leave. And then it will be just with the graduate students, both over Zoom and here in the room. We will wrap it up around 5.10, but we can continue with the discussion uh, at Homegrown. So we'll head out towards uh, Homegrown around 5.10. So please keep it within that time. Uh, with that, do we have any announcements today? Any good things? Someone submitted a paper, paper accepted, or oh, anything good. Got a cat, a dog. We got a paper accepted in uh, environmental science and technology on uh, critical metals and uh, the situation with China, the, the US China competition. So that, uh, that Thank you. Thank you for sharing the bright moment with us, mm -hmm. Dr. Ali. Anyone? Have paper accepted. Awesome, great. Thank you, Dr. Nella. The infant formula shortage with Geoform. So now we can't say if we have one submitted or not because we can't live up to it. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, this was accepted without revision, so I'm just right. blown out. Yeah. Anyone would like to share anything on diversity? I mean, I have one, so I don't know if you have received that email. Probably you did. There will be a presentation, I believe, on November 3rd. 5 p.m. on UD land, money, and American Indian. So if you can, please, please join and attend that presentation. Anyone else would like to share anything? I will mention that we did have a paper submitted to Estuarine Coasts and Environment. Great. And on uh, looking at various different machine learning algorithms, neural networks, random forest on, problems in the ele elevation data sets along coasts. Thank you so much, Dr. Salvi. Fingers crossed. Yeah. Okay, hey, so it is my great pleasure to introduce our seminar speaker today, Dr. Boucher Singh He's a postdoctoral research fellow at the Institute for Resources, Environment, and Sustainability at the University of British Columbia. He has a bachelor, he got a graduate degree in civil engineering from the Indian Institute of Technology, Delhi, and a master's degree from the University of Toronto. His research interests will be something that many of you are really interested in. It sits at the intersection of climate change, food systems, and water resources. He is also a contributing author to the water chapter in the sixth IEPC assessment report, the Intergovernmental Panel of Climate Change, um, and also has worked as a consultant for the World Bank. So without further ado, please welcome Dr. Sidhu. Thank you, thank you. I should probably record that and, uh, introduction and play it every day. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for staying back on a Friday evening. I'm not sure if I would have done it, but here we are. <laughs> I promise I won't bore you with too many equations because I've heard that every time an equation shows up on the screen, half the people go to sleep. So yeah. Um, yeah. So today I'll talk about my PhD research. I finished last year, still seems like a few weeks ago. So for those who are in the final stretch, persevere. Um, it's totally worth it. <laughs> so I'll briefly start with my academic journey. I come from a northwestern, the northwestern part of India, a state called Punjab. Um, it's called the um, grain capital or, or the, the breadbasket of India. It's where the green revolution started in this part of the country. And it's currently one of the most intensively farmed parts of the country, maybe even the world. Um, I completed my undergrad from IIT Delhi. Um, I was a civil engineer. We were discussing this earlier. There's a saying in India that first you do engineering and then you do what you want to do. So, but fortunately for me, civil and environmental are taught together, uh, like in many other universities over here as well. 
So I was able to develop my interest in environmental engineering, dabbling with air pollution modeling, some solid waste management. And uh, after that, I came to Toronto, University of Toronto for my master's. I worked on drinking water treatment, still an engineer, but I did not like the snow over there. So I moved to UBC Vancouver for my PhD, where I worked on food systems and climate change and food uh, and sustainable food systems. And uh, what do you know, 2016, when I moved there was a year when Vancouver got record snowfall. So correlation, causation, I don't know, but the year I moved there, we got a lot of snow there. So that is where I am right now. I'm uh, continuing my postdoc at UBC. Um, and what motivates me to do what I do? So that state that I uh, introduced earlier, Punjab, um, it's, it's this, this photo is from, um, and, and, uh, from a farm in Punjab and it encompasses everything that has to do with agriculture over there. There's paddy or rice being grown in the background and there's a tube well in the foreground which is using groundwater to irrigate uh, paddy. And that, that small state of Punjab, which is like, uh, uh, maybe 2% of the national area, it has 1.5 million of these groundwater wells and they are totally uncontrolled. Like they're, they're privately owned. Anyone can dig a well, anyone can start pumping groundwater. There are no water rights. Um, you can pump as much groundwater as you want to because you own the piece of land on top of it. So this, of course, has, has led to a lot of unsustainable groundwater irrigation, which has made this area a global hotspot of groundwater depletion. So probably um, you, you, you would be familiar with the valley situation in California, where the groundwater is sinking very rapidly. Punjab is probably beating that area. So not something that we're proud of, but yeah, we are beating California in terms of groundwater depletion. So for my PhD, I had no idea what I wanted to work on, but I knew that I wanted to work on agriculture and sustainability together. And I was fortunate enough to charter, to chart my own, um, to, to create my own project uh, at UBC. And uh, I'll, I'll discuss what I, what, I, what I did there. So Indian agriculture is important for multiple reasons. It's not, uh, it's not just that it's, uh, its contribution to global food systems is very significant. It produces 70% of the world's chickpeas, uh, one third of the world's millets, a quarter of the world's rice, but it also provides uh, employment to more than 40% of the workforce. And 40% is probably uh, hundreds of millions of people. They depend on agriculture for their, for their employment. And uh, almost half of it is rain fed. So they are even more vulnerable to climate change and it's associated um, the, the uncertainty that climate change brings to our weather systems. And my research, it grew out of a desire to use, to, use, to, to study the link between climate change and agriculture. And I started looking at statistical models, which are a very popular means of uh, eliciting the relationship between climate and agriculture. Uh, there's a lot of work that had already been done when I started and a lot of work that's already, that's, that continues to be done. And I made a small sick contribution to this field. We also have people in this department who are actually very um, actively engaged in this sort of research. And I wanted to investigate the value of these statistical models, particularly what, what can we do to improve our understanding of the climate agriculture relationship using these statistical models. So um, I had three main questions, but I started from the question at the bottom. So I wanted to know how will climate change impact agriculture? And when I looked at these statistical models, as all good PhDs, I realized I did not know what I did not know. So then I started knowing what I did not know. So then the first two questions came up. How do these models even behave? Before we even start using them, do we even know how they, how they, uh, how they predict what they predict? So how does the choice of climate variables affect these models? How does the modeling technique or the statistical techniques that we use, how does that affect the prediction of these models? Why or how should we choose a certain model over another? So these are the sort of questions I started uh, thinking about before I jump to the third one, where I actually use the models. So to briefly uh, explain the methods that I used. Okay. 
Yeah. So I had crop yield data. India fortunately has like extremely uh, um, extensive and good quality data. We have crop yield data from for for different districts of country uh, around 311 districts, uh, going back all the way to 1966. And we have uh, historical climate data as well. And essentially what we are doing is we are taking our climate data, we are using our crop yield data, and then we are trying to find a relationship between the two. That's, that's the crux of everything that I did in five years. And how do we do that? We use the climate data to create different variables which are known to impact crop yield. So of course, the average seasonal temperature, the total rainfall that uh, occurs over a season, those are important for the crop. But Equally important are uh, variables or uh, aspects such as what is the distribution of the rainfall over the season? How many days did it rain? Did it rain during the first few uh, weeks of, of, of the crop or did it rain during the, during the harvest season? So those are also critically important. And, and apart from average temperature, what was the distribution of this temperature? Was there a heat wave in the middle of the season which when, when uh, analyzed on the average doesn't show up in, this, in, the, in, in your signal, but you know that for a few days, the crop was exposed to really high temperatures. So those sort of things are also important. And at the same time, how do you model the relationship between the two, um, to the, the two aspects that you're looking at, crop yield and climate? You could use a simple model where you say that crop yield has a, linear relationship with temperature. For every one degree Celsius rise in temperature, crop yield goes up or goes down by X amount. Or you could say that, you know what, crop yield has a very nonlinear response to temperature. So I better fit a, a, a polynomial. Or you could even go further and say, we don't know what the relationship is. So I'll just let the model decide what it wants to do with the data. So the, the, there's, a, there's a whole range of flexibility that you can have when you're, when you're fitting those models. So for, for, for my work, I moved along these two axes and to see what sort of um, uh, interpretations and relationships come out of these models. What happens when we add more climate variables? What happens when we make it more flexible? So the first question, what, what, what happens when you add more, more climate variables to the data? So this is the first equation and Okay, everyone is awake, that's good. So what, what uh, this equation shows is that um, you have yield on the left side, yeah, um, which is your uh, variable of interest. And on the right side are the drivers. So those are the variables which impact yield. And as you all probably know, yield is not only determined by climate, but there are also non-climatic factors like the soil quality or access to, access to machinery or mechanization of the kind of uh, seeds that you have access to, better varieties are being developed over time. Um, farming techniques are improving over time. So in addition to climate, you also add fixed effects for time and space. So you have geography and time, and then you have climate. So these are the three major groups of variables which are known to impact crop yield. So you add them on the right side of the equation. So now the question is, uh, how does model improvement, how, how does the model performance change as you add more climate variables? And surprise, surprise, the models more or less perform similar to each other when you uh, gauge them in terms of the change in adjusted R square or R square, which is a measure of the fit of the model. So a model without any climate variables is more or less predicting crop yields just as well as a model with all the climate variables that I thought were important. From going from left to right, it doesn't really, uh, seem like it matters. Same is for RMSE, root mean squared error. So these are two popular metrics that are used for uh, gauging, crop, uh, gauging any model's um, performance. So this, this is not that something I, I have observed. This has been observed in past studies as well, that R squares and RMSEs don't change as much when you add extra variables to a model. And there's a, there's a school of thought which says that if the models are performing similar, you go with a simple one, uh, but uh, Occam's razor, you don't want to complicate stuff that doesn't need to be complicated. So maybe we don't even need to add all those extra climate variables that um, just the average temperature or precipitation is good enough. But then we, um, we divided the model performance into those three 
separate climate, uh, th those three separate variable groups that I talked about, geography, time, and climate. And we see that although time is more or less constant over the different models, the, the one shown in blue at the bottom, geography and climate, they compensate for each other. So as you add more climate variables to a model, the importance of climate increases and the relative importance of geography goes down. And relative importance over here is another statistical metric which um, calculates how the performance of the model changes on average when you add a certain variable. So it runs a whole different suite of models with different variables and the variable that the particular variable that you're interested in, it adds it to each of those and it averages out how, how much the performance of the model changed over, over, over on average. So we see that there's some compensation going on. So even though the overall performance of the model on average doesn't change, the importance of climate in that model, which has more climate variables is, is going up. So climate is playing some role which is being, uh, which is being uh, absorbed by geography in the simpler models. So we infer this to mean that the yield variance signal, which is explained by sub-seasonal variables is subsumed by geography uh, when those variables are not present. So all this is good theoretical uh, inferences. How does it impact the practical predictions of the models? So I picked up um, the, in, the, in the time period that I studied, I picked up the median, uh, I picked up a year when there was um, average rainfall or median rainfall, and I picked up a year where there was average or median temperature. So these are years when farmers were not exposed to any major uh, climate shocks. And the performance of the models is more or less similar as you go from left to right. So adding all those extra subseasonal variables doesn't seem to matter as much. But when you look at years when there was a drought or an extreme heat event, those subseasonal models start outperforming the seasonal models. So they are catching some signal which the subseasonal climate variable is carrying, and they are using it during anomalous years. So when there's, uh, when, when there's something unexpected happens, those models have the capacity to capture that. So it may be silent on average, but during those specific years or specific events, those models start outperforming the simpler models. Um, and this is on average for the whole of India, but if you start looking at, sub, sub, uh, at uh, state level analysis, um, there were some states and crops which really stood out that the sub-seasonal models were outperforming the seasonal models by a huge margin. But if you wanted to predict the impact of climate or, 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 or that weather event in that particular area of the country, sub-seasonal models were really, really critical. And this is one example of that. Um, so Rajasthan, this is, uh, this is for Rajasthan, a state in uh, India, which is a major producer of pearl millet. And pearl millet, I, I studied three crops and pearl millet was uh, the least irrigated out of those three. So it's more vulnerable to, um, uh, to climate. So in Rajasthan, pearl millet yield is affected as expected it was affected when there was a drought year. So all the models over predicted yield compared to what was actually observed because all models have a regression effect. By regression, it means that they always try to regress to the mean. They don't capture the full impact. It's always some part of the impact that models are able to capture. A perfect model would be able to capture the 100% of the impact, but we don't have perfect model. So anyways, uh, during the drought and the hot year, the models over predicted yields, but the simpler models over predictions were higher than the predictions of the sub-seasonal model. So if you were sitting, uh, if you were sitting in the state gov state government's department and you wanted to see what kind of yields you would see after this drought event, a sub-seasonal model was, was closer to the actual yields that were observed when the actual counting was done. And then uh, this was observed for all crops. I showed, I showed pearl millets in Rajasthan, but this was one of the stronger scenarios, but it was observed in general for all crops. So that was the key finding from this analysis of my, of my work, uh, that non-climatic variables can absorb the signal uh, from climate when, the climate when certain climatic variables are not present. The second question that I was interested in is, okay, uh, if you are, if once you know which variables are important, how do you decide how to model it? How do you decide the functional form that you expect the model to have? 
So for that, uh, yeah, for that I use two extreme cases. I, I, I mean, I call it um, statistics versus machine learning, but ML and statistics are really, they, they are the same, but yeah, yeah. Just, just think of linear regression as a simpler one, less flexible. You tell the model what sort of relationship you expect it to fit. And uh, a machine learning model is more flexible. You let it decide what you, what you want, what sort of relationship you want it to fit. So for uh, as a representative of ML, I use BRTs, boosted regression trees. They are also, um, they, they are a form of a tree method where the, the algorithm, it starts, uh, it starts by uh, identifying homogeneous regions in data and it starts bifurcating. Uh, it's, it's a very fancy uh, term for, uh, for, uh, for, for dividing data into similar chunks and then doing it so many times that you're able to see some patterns. So you don't start with any preconceived uh, notions about what sort of functional form the dependent and the independent variables have. So as expected, uh, I don't know, maybe I, should, I shouldn't say that. Um, the ML models outperformed linear regression in our case. They were able to understand the uh, relationship between climate and yields better than linear regression. Um, this is one of the biggest reasons is because I was doing this analysis at the national level and I am in linear regression, I'm uh, actively um, fitting a priori, uh, I'm actively making some a priori assumptions about the final functional form that the model should output. So I, in even within linear models, I also try to fit some quadratic terms for the climate variable. So I did not just look at linear uh, uh, relationships. And I also had some segmented analysis. So SGM stands for segmented. So where I let the model decide if there was a place in the in, in, in the data space where the relationship changed abruptly. For example, it goes up. So as temperature goes up, yields go up, but suddenly when temperature keeps going up, yields start going down. So that sort of thing. I also let the model do some segmented analysis. Despite all that, uh, the BRTs outperformed the model, both in terms of um, actual yield predictions, as well as the the, the the improvement in model prediction as climate variables are added to it. So this is the, oh, you don't have a screen now. <laughs> so this is the improvement in model compared to a null model, which doesn't have climate in it. So all of these are compared to this, to their corresponding null models without climate. Um, and I started by saying that ML is less interpretable. Uh, that that comes with an asterisk attached to it because you can fit some uh, partial dependence plots out of any model that you have. A uh, partial dependence plot is essentially a plot that shows how the relation, how the model uh, thinks the relationship between your uh, dependent variable and any of the independent variables, how it changes as the IV changes. So you pick up a range of the variable of interest, uh, which is temperature and precipitation over here. And then you see how the yield uh, changes as, as those variables change. So we see that over here, um, the ML model is shown in magenta, which maybe the color choice wasn't the best over here. But we see that the ML model um, is able to pick up some nuanced relationships, which the linear model, even with the segmented part, is not as uh, accurate at picking up. So for example, it says that temp as temperatures increase, uh, permanent yields are not as impacted, but suddenly there's a point beyond which uh, yields start going down as temperature increases, which has physiological basis as well. We know that plants don't react to temperature in a linear fashion. There are points beyond which uh, the, the, the plants actually um, hate any rise in temperature. Same with precipitation. Um, Precipitation rise increases yields, but only to a certain point beyond which it, it, it doesn't really uh, help the plant. Sorry, I'm missing something here. No. And um, from this analysis, I wanted to see have crop yields already been impacted by climate change? Because we could, I mean, I also did some future analysis, which I'll talk about later. But climate change has been going on for a long time. 
So I wanted to see, is there some impact which has already happened? So what I, I, I did a very simple analysis for this. I simply took away a linear trend in temperature and precipitation. I took it away and I made it uh, a zero linear zero trend over time. And I just assumed this is my no climate change scenario, hypothetical scenario where climate hasn't changed. And my actual data was my climate change scenario. And the difference between the yield prediction from those two models, from those two data, was taken as the impact of climate change. And we see that uh, both for linear regression and for BRTs, there are some parts of the country which have already faced uh, uh, adverse, uh, adverse effects on crop yields. Um, and this overlaps really well with areas which are already hot. Uh, like the northwestern part of uh, part of India, um, that's Rajasthan, which is a big pearl millet producer. And because we see that, because because we also know that the temperature crop yield relationship is not linear, and uh, hotter temperatures have a have an even have an even bigger impact. Uh, Rajasthan is suffering because of the climate change um, situation over there because it was already hot and it's getting even hotter. So. Um, but this, this, uh, I, I would, I won't claim that the partial dependence plots tell the whole story, because we also see that sometimes the partial dependence plots say that a certain climate variable is not important at all. For example, this is for rice, and uh, machine learning or the BRT partial dependence plot is more or less flat, which is a sort of a red flag because we know that rice yields are sensitive to climate, and Fitting a such a horizontal relationship between rice yields and um, and and temperature was a was was a point of concern for us. So we dug deeper into it. Uh, one way to 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 diagnose this is with some synthetic data. So the actual data that I have, I don't actually know what the relationship between yield and climate is. So I created my own synthetic data and saw and checked if BRT was able to find out the relationship that I had created in the synthetic data. And I saw that the BRT sometimes conflated the relationship between time and climate, like the previous analysis that I showed. So if temperature is going on over time and time is going on over time, the signal between time and temperature to a BRT doesn't seem any different. It doesn't know that temperature and time are different variables and then one one has a it, it doesn't know which has what impact on uh, on yields so if temperature and time are both going on both both have a similar trend then it's easy then it's possible for the model to conflate those two and we found that from our synthetic data analysis as well we also wanted to check um so when, when we when we fit a linear regression we tell it um what sort of relationship we want and usually uh, that relationship we have is, is, is applicable to the whole, uh, to, to all the data that you have. For example, you say that time has uh, a coefficient of beta and that beta is applicable to, the, to, all the, to all the data that you have. But maybe some, but maybe different parts of the country behave differently to temperature, right? It's possible that irrigated areas, which has been uh, observed in some parts of the world, that areas which have irrigation have a positive relationship with time, uh, with, with sorry temperature, but areas which don't have access to irrigation have a negative relationship with temperature uh, yields in those areas. So we uh, created synthetic data which had spatially varying yield climate relationship, and the BRT was able to understand it or elicit it very very easily. A linear regression, not so much because we were telling it that the relationship is linear or if the relationship is the same throughout the throughout the year. And another test we did with synthetic data was for um, uh, observing or for identifying unknown interactions. So when you fit a linear regression or when you fit any model, there are some interactions that you expect. For example, irrigation and precipitation. If precipitation is going is 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 a variable of importance, and you also have irrigation in your model, you can you can tell the model that irrigation will have a dampening effect on the impact of precipitation. But there are interactions which are unknown and unobserved or, uh, or obscure, like 
there are studies that show that irrigation also has a dampening effect on the temp uh, on dampening effect on the impact that temperature has on crop yields. If there's an extreme heat wave, uh, irrigation can actually help the plant get through it better without a, uh, compared to a plant which doesn't have irrigation. So linear regression, of course, will be able to find these um, uh, relationships if you specify them when you start model when you when you specify your model. But with a BRT or ML, because it, it, it because you don't have to input any a priori functional form, it's able to understand relationships just based on the data that you input. So these are those are advantages and disadvantages to both the to both the models. One is obviously more interpretable than the other, and um, there are some uh, with added flexibility. The model is free to do some uh, some some things that you don't want it to do, but it's also able to identify relationships that you would otherwise not expect. Then comes the question of the future of Indian agriculture, which was which was actually what I started with. Um, we know that climate is changing. We know uh, we can fit some relationships between climate and crop yields. I used CMIP six climate projections to the end of this century. Uh, for four different emission scenarios, and then I, um, for, for, um, I, I won't go into the details, but I also fit a soil moisture model because precipitation directly doesn't affect crops. It's always through soil moisture that's a, that the biggest impact is. So I had three different uh, climate models. Like I had a seasonal model with only temperature and precipitation. I had subseasonal with subseasonal temperature precipitation and a subseasonal with temperature and soil moisture. And then I had all those different statistical techniques. So I had, a, I had a matrix of models, which I then used for predicting future crop yields. Uh, this is just to show that temperature is changing. Um, and more than that, the nighttime temperature is warming up faster than daytime, which is to say that the diurnal range of temperature is decreasing. And this has been shown to adversely affect rice yields. Uh, and more than that, it's not just that temperature is rising, it's also hitting the critical thresholds more rapidly. For example, for every one degree rise in temperature, one degree Celsius rise in temperature, I have to specify when in the US, um, the, the, the degree days that a crop accumulated in the 20 to 30 degree bracket, a fancy, fancy way of saying the amount of time it spent in the 20 to 30 degree bracket, that increased by 14%. But the time it spent in the greater than 30 degree bracket during the winter season, it increased by 63% for every one degree Celsius rise in temperature. And that is detrimental to wheat, which is a major winter crop in India, because uh, it, it has been shown physiologically that um, during wheat's flowering stage, uh, if temperatures are above 31 degrees Celsius, they have a detrimental effect on, uh, on your wheat yield. Uh, precipitation is more or less increasing throughout the country, except uh, certain parts in eastern India uh, during the winter season, and so is soil moisture. So soil moisture is primarily driven by precipitation. And what does it do to crop yields? Um, more or less, all my models predict uh, three to four to five percent reduction in average crop yields over uh, across the country for the three crops that I studied. Uh, except for some soil moisture, linear regression models, most of them say that crop yields are going down. Um, you would also recognize that there's a lot of variation in the predictions. And most of these, uh, a big chunk of these, this variation comes from the fact that I analyze 13 different GCMs, um, data from 13 different GCMs, and they also have their own uncertainty attached to them. They have different uh, climate, project, uh, climate predictions going into the future. Over here, I'm only talking about a middle of the road emission scenario, SSP2 by 2050. But if you, as you go to higher emission and you go to the end of the century, these predictions obviously, they, 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 the, the adverse effects are magnified. But more than that, I observed a lot of spatial variation in, in, the, in the impact of climate on crop yields. Um, some areas may benefit from, from, the, from the impact of climate change, probably the areas which have irrigation and which are not as hot already. But there are big parts of the country where crop yields are, may go down by up to 10 to 15 to 20% because they're already in the hotter parts of the country. 
they don't they don't already rajasthan just so you know rajasthan is one of the driest hottest hottest parts of the country and they are growing pearl millets which are without irrigation and, and um so they though that's one of the most vulnerable parts of the country these are the five biggest pearl millet producer states and most of them are in the red so um we know that crop yields will be impacted what do we do with this with this data what we can do is we can identify areas and crops which are critical. For example, uh, Rajasthan and Madhya Pradesh, these two states, uh, they are um, they, they produce pearl millets, and crop and pearl millet yields over there are uh, highly vulnerable to um, climate change. I reran my models, assuming they have more access to irrigation, and then I saw that pearl millet production in, uh, in, in some districts, irrigation access could reduce yield losses back to 33%. So instead of 30% yield loss, you see 20%. So irrigation is not nullifying the impact of climate change, but it is reducing it. Now, the, the, I, I would like to um, uh, make a statement over here that Rajasthan does not have as much water Bring irrigation to 50% of the farmers. This is an exercise to show what can happen with irrigation, but also how big the problem is that you can't really uh, supply um, water to farmers um, as easily as you would want to. Um, I, did, I in in, a, in an unrelated study, I also did some groundwater and electricity and that sort of analysis, and it this this part of the country is already facing big water and groundwater depletion. And uh, the, the policies over there actually need to move away from groundwater irrigation because, because of the lack of water. And uh, my models are saying that irrigation is needed. So it's like a cash 22 situation. So um, the finding from this was that up to five to 6% crop yield losses could be observed, but these are highly dependent on modeling choices and GCM uncertainty and the area of the country that you're looking at. Um, can I take maybe four or five more minutes? Yeah. Okay. Uh, future work that I'm doing and I want to do is I want to extend it to other crops. Uh, I picked representative crops. So rice is a summer crop, which is highly irrigated. The winter is one of the most important winter crop. Uh, wheat is, a, is one of the most important winter crops and pearl millet is a summer or a curry crop which doesn't have as much access to irrigation. And I'll and this is all statistical analysis. I also want to integrate it with process-based models, which are based in crop physiology. They, 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 they have, they use evidence from actual results and analysis to fit a uh, relationship between climate and crop yields. And from my um, interaction with some uh, people involved in policy making and government, they don't really care as much about 2100 they care more about the end of season because the problem is right here and right now if there's a heat wave or a drought or or a flood they want to know what it's going to do to crop yields three months from now rather than what a what climate change will do in 2100 that is just because that is how policy making works and there are elections every five years so that's that's it doesn't their, their vision doesn't go beyond that so near-term yield predictions are really, really critical. And uh, a timely prediction can actually help um, in, in coming up with policies which can support farmers, both in terms of uh, setting up insurance schemes, but also at the same time, maybe um, giving them better advisories on when to harvest and how to harvest. Um, I'll give you a small example of what I mean by that. So in March this year, um, Northwestern part, northern part of India, not just northwestern. Northern part of India uh, experienced a very uh, unexpected and untimely heat wave. April is usually when um, uh, hot temperatures are experienced, but this time a, a strong heat wave hit this part of the country in March, and that is when wheat crop is uh, is ripening and it's ready for harvest in early April. So. This, uh, the map on the left shows temperature anomalies ex uh, compared to expected temperatures in February, early March. And then on the right shows, uh, the map on the right shows the heat anomalies when that heat wave hit. So temperatures were, were five or six degrees higher than expected, again, Celsius. 
and degree days were even worse because as we discussed that temperature over there is just close to close to that 30 degree threshold uh, march february march is usually hovering around 25 26 in in that part of the country and growing degree days anomalies were almost 100% so twice as much uh, heat exposure in that uh, th greater than 30 degree bracket uh, to wheat in that in, in that part of the country and my analysis says that on average, um, India probably uh, faced wheat yield loss this year of five, four to five percent compared to an average year. And some parts of the country they were probably even worse, uh, up to uh, five to ten percent. Now the, the the thing with these sort of analysis is that even though harvest season has ended, it ended in April, we don't actually have uh, accurate numbers on how much wheat was produced because that data is not uh, available till the end of this year. It's still being collected and brought together. So we don't know how the farmers were affected or how farmer livelihood was affected by this crop, uh, by, by this heat wave. So these sort of analysis, if done in time, can probably help in policy making. Um, and this, this monsoon has also been a bit uh, un, unconventional. Uh, the, the first half of the monsoon was drier than usual. Uh, I, I, I'm not showing it today, but I did some quick analysis and the current rice crop, which is almost ready to harvest or being harvested right now, that is also facing some uh, yield losses compared to an average year this year. So this is one of those rare occurrences when the biggest crops in India, both of them faced uh, weather extremities because of which both of, both of their yields are expected to be lower. And with that, I would thank you all for listening to me. Uh, my supervisory team, uh, Naveen, Milind, and Mark. And this work was funded by a Vanier Canada Graduate Scholarship and a UBC four-year doctoral fellowship. And uh, thank you for listening. Hi. Hi. Uh, I want to relate, you were talking about model performance earlier on, and then later on you were talking about the need for near-term prediction. So models really don't necessarily need to be that accurate. They just need to give you good, actionable information. Do you have a feel for what kind of actionable information is required? So does a model just have to say the extremes are more likely or it's more likely the precipitation and crop yield would be in the top 10 or 50%? Is that good enough? And would the same model performance statistics be applied to actionable threshold as opposed to absolute values? So if I understand correctly, you mean if a model says that crop yields are going to be five to 10% lower than expected, does the model accuracy matter? Is that? Yes, and is that what the kind of information that the policymakers would need for planning? Do they just need that five or 10% versus any actual values? Oh, that's a good question. So what, what are they looking for? They are essentially looking for the, the magic number they want is what sort of harvest would they see three months from now? And our work is essentially coming up with a model which can get as close to the actual number as possible. Um, this, these models, they can be ground truth every year. So when the wheat numbers come out, I'll be able to say if my predictions were any closer uh, to the actual numbers or was the, or, or there, there were some, there were some predictions that uh, India, in some parts of the country, uh, or there were some predictions which the predictions which are higher than mine, the the impact, and some which are lower than mine. So I'm saying it's four to five percent. Some said it's up to twenty percent. But we'll only know when the actual numbers come out. The government is saying it's two to three percent. So, but when you have such a big area under cultivation, those two percent numbers are also critical. So I'd, I'd say. I won't present the model accuracy figures to the policymakers, but I would want I, I would want those for myself to select models which can be the most accurate and most have, have the highest predictive capacity. And then I can use them to show them. Like I, I could show them a suite of models, but that would not really help them. I they Perfect. want the one number without any confidence intervals. Does that does that help? Yes. <laughs> yeah. I, um...
thank you for the presentation and uh, i was actually born and raised in rajasthan so it's, it's very interesting to see some research done but also makes me sad on what's happening as we all can see on the screen uh my question is actually an extension of what john asked uh it's uh, pertaining to the, your first half of the presentation where you uh, we're discussing seasonal and sub-seasonal models, and uh, you showed a plot where uh, they were overperforming, but the sub-seasonal model was slightly less overperforming. Uh, and you had many variables on the right side of your equations. I'm just curious uh, about the quantification of uncertainty about all these three major variables of geography, space, and uh, time, cl climate variables, geography, and time. That uh, do you still think what 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 are the contributing elements that are still going into overestimating the subseasonal models and um, yeah okay um, you mean this one or uh, it was it was somewhere on the right uh, top right not this one no. yes this I one. Think. Is this the one which has, uh, yeah, yeah, uh, seasonal and sub seasonal? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, could you just repeat your question? So, you, you did mention that the sub seasonal models are also overestimating it, yeah, but the overestimation is a little less. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm sure you are aware of like the uncertainty that every climate variable, the space variable, and the time variable is introducing in your equation of the model. But do you still think, uh, about variables that can be tweaked or changed to reduce? The, that overestimation that you are still having because i think that would bring us more closer to what john uh, was asking that you know what's the overall answer we can get for the policy makers to be more sure about okay this is happening Okay, I'm not sure I get your question, but are you saying that if I have some uncertainty analysis, the difference between the two might not be uh, yes. significant, you mean to say? Oh, yeah. So over here, I have plotted each district as a scatter plot. But if you take the if, if you if you take the average over the whole season, for example, these plots, then the the difference between the performance is significant. So the red bars and the blue bars. And I, I, I could show the confidence in the intervals on these and they are significant. So the sub-seasonal model is outperforming the seasonal model by a significant amount. So over here, I've just plotted a scatter plot of all the districts in Rajasthan. And uh, I, these are point predictions for each district. So I wasn't sure, I'm, I'm not sure how, um, I mean, I, I, I could plot, I could plot, uh, so there's the median value and I could plot a confidence interval on it but there would be a significant difference between the two right. coming, coming, from, coming from this figure. Yes. So the sub-seasonal model, because it is significantly outperforming the seasonal model, I would choose the sub-seasonal model. Yeah, but like uh, the sub-seasonal model has a lot of intricate elements. That's why it's performing better, right? Mm -hmm. But I'm, I'm, my bother, botheration is every single additional elements uh, that are making it perform better is also introducing uncertainty into the model, right? How so? No, I'm not saying uh, that it doesn't, but what, what do you mean by introducing uncertainty? Because all these variables are also predicted, right? Yeah. They're not observed variables. No, that is observed climate, right? Okay. The actual climate variables that I'm adding, they are observed climate. They all are right, created right. from observed okay. climate. Okay. Does that help? Yes, yes. Okay. We have yeah. questions from Kunari. Please feel free to unmute. I, I have a question here. Can I, I, I am in Zoom here. Hi. My name is Gabriela Mundaka. Hello, Hello hi. Uh, thank you for your talk. It was very interesting. I would just have a simple question here. I was wondering whether um, you will consider to do these estimations by regions because what I know is that uh, India is very, you know, the geography is, is very different. I mean, it's extremely different from each other, right? So I don't know if your predictions are going to vary according to the region. You know, some regions are, you know, very dry, some other are very humid and so on, right? So would you be considering this in the future research or you have, maybe you have done it already? Uh, yeah, so the question is, if I, if I understand correctly, you mean because India is such a 
big country in terms of geographical variation. Yes. Um, maybe we need different models for different parts of the country. Yes, that's correct. Yeah, that that is true. Uh, so when I fit a, for example, when I when I fit a linear fun, linear regression for the whole country, I'm assuming that the relationship holds for the relationship is the same for all parts of the country. So as as you go uh, to a lower level, you would have models which are more attuned to that area. Um, I started with India as a whole because that is usually the 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 middle ground of a global analysis at a very very regional analysis. But uh, yeah, I mean, I've, I've always uh, thought about that as well, that India probably doesn't need, should, should also be analyzed in, in, in terms of its geographical zones or ecoregions. So those models would um, for sure be better suited. In fact, um, you don't really need to run models separately. Uh, machine learning, the machine learning model is already, um, sort of taking care of it because you do input geography into it. For linear regression, you just need to fit more interaction between geography and climate, and it will be able to understand that. So it's all a question of where do you draw a line in terms of what sort of relationship you expect. Uh, for example, if you think that temperature has a positive relationship with crop yields in one part of the country and a negative in the other, then probably you need interaction between geography and climate, uh, in geography and temperature, yeah. We would have yes, uh, we would have a um, question just for graduate students. So if you are not a graduate student, please feel free to ask the question now. We would have maybe three more minutes, and then we will leave, and only graduate students will be here on Zoom and in the room. And I know John has a question. Uh, just a quick one to talk about your engineering background. Do you know of any future engineering solutions where maybe we can discount that timing of the extremes that may happen if we could capture or if it's in place right now in India where you can capture a lot of that rainwater extremes and then apply it when needed during droughts or other times or not I and we could know. always build another dam but yeah I, I don't think that's a solution <laughs> Like an engineer would always want to build down. Um, just kidding. Um, <laughs> there are some, so if we have a really robust weather prediction system, Indian weather is really hard to predict. One, because monsoon is inherently very unpredictable. If we have a good weather prediction system, we can always tweak the sowing and harvesting date. So that is one, one way to do it. And, and it does happen. Uh, it doesn't happen like a hundred percent scientifically, but it does happen from farmer's experience, which is, probably better than these models, I would say. Um, the farmers, uh, depending on when it rains and when it when, when it's dry, they do uh, change their sowing dates, especially in areas which are not intensively farmed, which the way they want to get two or three crops uh, out, of the, out, of, out of their uh, farm every year. So those sort of things can be done. In terms of saving flood water for use later, it's, it's probably a, Hard, hard call. I mean, there are solutions like cover cropping where you, where you don't leave your land fallow just so it doesn't develop a crust and then let the water flow away so it can absorb it. Those sort of things can happen. But in the, the Punjab, the state where I come from, they never leave the land fallow. They are probably harvesting a crop today and sowing next week. So over there, those type of solutions won't work. Um, there is some work that came out from Bangladesh recently where they showed that groundwater irrigation has actually helped them um, unintentionally sort of. They help, it has helped control flooding because the soil has capacity to hold more water after you use it to, for, to irrigate. So in parts where there is enough groundwater, um, there, there is evidence that groundwater irrigation can actually help control flood floods, but uh, yeah, it is entirely region dependent for sure. Um, and for heat, um, like irrigation has some uh, mitigating effect, but at the end of the day, heat is really not something that can be controlled for. So go climate mitigation, climate change mitigation. So I would thank Dr. Sudhu for thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And if you are a graduate student, please stay on. Uh, but 
If you are here in the room, please also join us uh, to home rooms. I if you have a question, but I can ask you that. Okay. <laughs> uh, we can stop recording. Thank you.